Jeff asked me to read uh, the passage he's going to preach on this morning or this evening. So if you turn to your your Bibles to the Gospel according to Mark, chapter fourteen, verse thirty-two. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, "Sit here while I pray." And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And Father, we ask You would bless now Your servant as he comes to break open Your Word to us. Lord, meet with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're very, very grateful to have Tim in England at this time. I personally look forward to our weekly times of prayer together and our fellowship and working on various things. It's been such fun. When he came, the situation was very grim in Manchester. The Bride of Christ was dying. The Body of Christ was very sick. Um, I don't know who else could have done what Tim has done to have revived and united and made uh, a perplexed, divided congregation, contented and earnest and seeing again their vocation. And in a city like Manchester, there are two cities only 20 miles apart, great important cities, Liverpool and Manchester. Liverpool has had an evangelical tradition, a gospel tradition, fine pulpits. Manchester has not had that, Uh, and it's crucial. uh, A city which has 100,000 students should have a a gospel testimony and um, uh, a living, credible congregation, and it's getting that, and we're thankful (laughs) and uh, personally to have these lovely people as my friends. It's been a sweetness in my old age. (laughs) Let's look at the Word of God. Mark chapter 14, that's just been read to you. I want to reflect firstly about the Lord praying. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed. And we find that three times he was told, that he prayed three times. Now, why is that worth reflecting on? Well, surely for one thing, the the very fact that he prays, that he prays, because you know what prayer is? Prayer is impotence grasping at omnipotence. And here is Christ praying, Christ in the reality of impotence reaching out towards omnipotence. His prayer is the single 
greatest indication of his own sense of dependence, of his own independent human sense that with the limited created resources he had at his disposal, he simply couldn't handle the situation that was emerging before him. And I uh, think we must drive it, ram it home to the depths of our consciousness that being dependent and being conscious that we are so dependent is not a sign of sinfulness. It's a sign of createdness. It's a sign of humanness. And it's a reminder to us that if he felt that he couldn't bear this load, he couldn't climb this mountain, he couldn't ford this river, he couldn't overcome this temptation, except by strong cryings and tears which he offered to God, then how before God? Can we hope to go through life day by day and say to God, Father, it's okay. I can handle it. And never come to God in this crushing sense of our own sheer impotence, of our own dependentness on Him to get us through. Because when Christ is praying, He's saying in the most eloquent fashion possible, there is no way in my naked, in my unaided humanness, I can carry this cross. I can endure the sledgehammer and the nails and the spear and the mockery that I can finish the work, that I can bear the load and I can emerge from this trial. And that is why we have a praying Christ. He's the incarnate Son of God. He's the living power of God. He's the wisdom of God. He is the enfleshment of all the ability of God's grace, and yet he is praying. And doesn't it say that no matter what your position might be in a church, how long you have been a Christian, the number of your gifts, the quality of your gifts, the length and depth of the experience of God's love that you have known in your life, there's no way that you and I will ever emerge into a situation where we are spiritually independent of God. There's no way that we can face any day without prayer, that we can carry any load without prayer, that we can climb any mountain without prayer. I don't mean that we should develop a prayer life in the sense of much Christian mysticism when prayer becomes almost an end in itself. But I do mean that we can only survive in the awareness of our own weakness, and that every load is too big, and every obligation is too big, and every burden is too heavy, and every temptation is too strong, and every privilege is too dangerous. And here is Christ, and he never failed, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he had the most marvelous charismata on a human level alone, more right than any other creature to pretend to being independent. And yet, here he is, felt impotence, grasping at omnipotence. And not only that, but the earnestness with which he prayed, he not only prays, he falls to the ground. In fact, he throws himself on the ground. And we know from elsewhere, not only is this the prostration of earnestness, but we know th that he agonizes, agonizes, I, I must pray. I've got to pray. I must tell my father about this. I mustn't stop praying now. I mustn't think of all the things that are happening tonight and tomorrow. I must go to my Father. And he pours forth his prayers, and his sweat is like great drops of blood as the spiritual struggle is registered even on his physical body. So he prayed. That's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing I want to say 
you know you see some of these things and you wish you could see them more clearly. But what I do see here is the fact that it was not God's will to answer his prayer. The cup did not pass. And part of what I've got here is the marvelous paradox of the Messiah praying for what God did not intend to give. Indeed, praying earnestly for what God had no intention of giving to him. Now, you see the relevance of that for ourselves. Sometimes Christians get into terrible trouble in their souls because God doesn't seem to be listening to what they're asking for. You remember Paul beseeching the Lord three times concerning a thorn in his flesh. It throbbed, and Paul was distracted by it. And he could describe to God all the benefits that would come if this thorn in the flesh would be removed, the strength he would have, the attention he could give, the counseling, the traveling, the writing, the preaching, all would be improved if this thorn in the flesh would be removed. Three times, three great sessions where this, he rolled it out before the Lord. Am I going to say, well, he must have been an unspiritual man. He ought to have known that it was given to him by the Lord. It was the messenger of Satan, but the gift of the Father. It was God's will for him. And he needed to be usable and useful he had letters to the Romans and Ephesians and the Colossians. He had so much that he needed to do. And a proud man who had been caught up to the third heaven and seen sights and heard words that it wasn't lawful to share with anyone. Um, such a puffed up man is not meet for the master's use. And so God has the thorn as a counterpoise to the blessings. And so Paul then should have seen that, and he should have said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord anyway. There's no hint of that. And we have in Christ the creature expressing his creatureliness, his own shrinking from all that lay before him tomorrow, shrinking from his longing, to escape it. What he fears will be God's will for him the next day, but what he longs may not be God's will. And in that passion, in that earnestness of importunity and commitment, he prays that God's will may be different from what he dreads, but what he believes is to be God's will for him. You know, we say, ah, the moment you know something is God's will, it's easy. Well, for some of you, maybe. But the whole glory of Gethsemane was that God's will wasn't easy. It was not easy even for the Lord himself, even for him any more that the thorn in the flesh throbbing away day after day was easy for a blessed apostle. There's no use you saying to Paul, ah, oh, well, it's God's will. It was still sore. And many times in life, it's God's will. And it hurts. It really hurts. It hurts bad. And we shrink from it, and we long to be delivered from it. And today, I must confess that I don't feel as bad as I used to when I find God's will difficult to bear. 
I don't react critically when I find God's poor, struggling people, and they're saying, Pastor, brother, it's so hard. Because it is hard. God's will for us is sometimes hard. It was hard for Christ. And I'm not surprised when those who are going through those things plead with God to change things. Lord, bend the universe. Lord, make things different for me. Christ in his agony, probing. Christ in his agony, crying. Father, is there any possibility that you can give me a different cup to drink? Oh, I want that so very badly. And that's why he throws himself on the ground, and he's longing to have a different cup. And he is the archetypal man. He is God's great definition of what a man is. He is, Luther calls him, the proper man. He is the pioneer. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I take such comfort from this that he, that he wasn't finding it easy. He doesn't find automatic comfort in the knowledge. Well, this is God's will. He doesn't take it in his stride. He's praying. He's praying with all his effort. He's sweating blood. And he's crying, and yet he's praying submissively. Yet not my will, but thine be done. What marvelous depths there are in it, that the two wills are not exactly coincidental. That what Christ wanted, what Christ desired, what Christ longed for was not exactly what was contained in the cup that his Father gave to him. And yet there is submission. There is submissiveness. Not a submission that pretends that this is what he wants, but where there is a frank acknowledgement that it's hurting him so much and he is confessing how he's hurting to his heavenly Father. And he's asking his Father, why? You know, it's, it's not sinful when certain things happen to us. And we say to God, why, Lord? Why this loss? Why this pain? Why this cross? That's not sinful, because Jesus said, why? I'm saying, Father, it, it does hurt, but not my will, but thine be done. I'm not going to pretend that I love things just as they are, if I could arrange them. And sometimes as I try to bear my load, and move through pain. And there's a little voice saying somewhere, you can't be right with God. Because if you were right with God, then you would see this is the will of God for you. Then you would be a happy bunny. I'm not. I don't for a single moment believe that Jesus Christ enjoyed Calvary. It was pain but he submitted to it. Not my will, but thine be done. So I've talked about his praying and the fact of it, and then I've spoken to you of the way that uh, he found the will of God so very difficult. And then the third thing, the fact that he was answered and the way he was answered. It's amazing that he prays and he prays 
so earnestly and he prays so submissively. But it's amazing the way God answers. There appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. It's not in the Mark account, it's in Luke 22 and verse 43. Now let's think of that angel. One of our great Scottish theologians said, after he had seen Jesus in heaven, he wanted to meet the angel that had comforted his Savior. Well, you ponder that angel, ye holy angels bright, that wait at God's right hand and through the realms of light fly at their Lord's command. And that particular day, all the angels appeared in the morning before God to receive their orders for the day, like the Lord gave to me uh, this day. And he said certain things in it. And God said, well, I, I want Jeff to be free from certain distractions. I want him to preach uh, this message tonight to the people gathered there. And I, I want every one of you, every one of them, he told the angels, you make sure now that they're all there tonight. And the angels immediately fly to his command. And if we could see them, we we would see not only the Savior walking the aisle and sitting next to us and nudging us and applying this word to each of us, but we'd see the angels listening, seeing their master and raising our worship to a taste of heaven. So one angels was given this this order, go to your Lord. You'll find your Lord in Gethsemane. He's in the garden. He's lying on the ground. You encourage your Creator. You speak to Him words of strength and consolation. Speak into the heart of my only begotten Son. And that's what this angel did. There was never a more amazing mission than that. An angel sent to comfort God the Son. How did he do it? Well, we're not told. Um, maybe he adored him. He arrayed before him this Lord who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable in his being and wisdom and power and holiness and justice and goodness and truth and worshipped him. Maybe that was the way he lifted this man up. Or maybe with two of his wings he flew, and two of the wings he covered his feet, and two of the wings he covered his eyes. And seeing this broken man, he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Or did he say to him, your father sent me to tell you how much he loves you. And never has he loved you more than your willingness to humble yourself to death, even the death of the cross. There never was a creature given such honor as that angel sent to comfort his Lord. Then the last thing I want to say to you is that having prayed and been comforted, the Lord stands. The Lord is erect. The Lord is composed. He comes to these men who are struggling against sleep and falling asleep and are filled with sorrow. Arise, he says, let's go. He's gone through the struggle. 
I would say for a moment he was faltering, not sinfully, but humanly. He's overwhelmed, but not now, not by verse 42. There is this man now composed, rises to his full height, stands forth in the spiritual strength that an angel has brought to him from heaven. All the resources are now made available that he can endure the beating up and the lashes and the carrying of the cross and the nails and the spear thrust and the taste of death in the anathema. And from that moment then, as you read the Gospels, you have a masterful Christ. You have one when Judas comes, he's in control. When he stands before the various authorities, before the Sanhedrin, and before Pilate, and before Herod, he immediately asserts his authority over them. It's a great word to ourselves, the composure that comes from fellowship with the living God. The things you learn when God draws near, when you and he are there together, and you ask him, Lord, I can't face this interview. I can't take this journey. I can't cross the sea to another country without help from you. I, I must have you. And you must be here with this flock. You must be active. You must bless, Lord. And when I know you are going to give me strength and them strength, then we can be at peace. So he is there, composed and ready. Now I want to say a word about the failure of the disciples. Such spectacular failure. They took taken into the garden to be with their Savior, to assist him and comfort him and watch with him, keep their eyes open. He wants to shut his eyes and pray earnestly and th just give himself to God and there to watch through the trees. Are there torches coming? Are there the sound of branches being broken? Are, are there men coming near with swords and staves? What, watch with me now. He says, um, they failed him. They failed despite their position and their office. These men are apostles, Peter and James and John. They are amongst the most eminent of the apostles, of all the people in the world. They are the three that form the, the inner group his close companions. He loves them deeply. I don't know in how many ways to turn this. Shall I say, the church expects too much from its leaders. Or shall I say, the leaders presume too much on their status, as if our office were going to keep us. Both are true, Every church must know that those who lead it are human beings, vulnerable men, falling men, stumbling men, sometimes overwhelmed with the challenges and the problems that confront them. Every leader must know the same truth about himself. He is a failing man. He's a weak man. Without Christ, he can do absolutely nothing at all. He's vulnerable. And if he pretends otherwise, his whole personality will break in the struggle which that dissemblance involves. The church must reckon on the creatureliness of its leaders. The church must reckon on their humanness. The office will not keep them. Take heed to yourself. And then you will see this. 
they failed in spite of their privileges. They'd spent three years in the presence of Christ. They'd seen Lazarus rise from the dead. They'd been in the upper room and heard that glorious discount. They discourse. They'd sat in the on the mount, and they'd heard the sermon on the mount. He'd given them authority to cast out demons and lead people to Christ. They'd baptized many people. They'd seen the widow of Nain's son raised from his coffin. Great, great privileges they had. Sometimes we are so naive. And we measure pastors and we measure preachers in terms of the behavior of their people. And we think that wherever there is a pulpit where the whole counsel of God is preached, that it's going to show itself infallibly in the lifestyle and the conduct of all who listen to that preaching. Well, these people had been three years with Christ. Was it through lack of teaching that they failed? Was it through lack of an example they failed? Was it through lack of pastoral care? Did they have questions that Jesus refused to answer? It doesn't matter what privileges we have. The church at Galatia had Paul as its founder and pastor of the church in Corinth, had Paul and Apollos and Cephas, church at Philippi, church at Ephesus. They all had tremendous privileges. None of those things alone could keep them. These disciples, when you bear in mind, had just been in the upper room with the Lord. They'd sat through the glorious discourse of 13, 14, 15, 16 of John, and then the, the greatest prayer ever prayed in chapter 17. And then he's, they sing a psalm together, and they go to the garden together, and they failed. They failed miserably. There's no way that the privileges you have here as a congregation, that's not going to keep you. And Furthermore, they failed despite warnings because the Lord had been most emphatic. He had said as he distributed the Passover meal that one of you is going to betray me. He had said to Peter, you will deny him. He said to all of them, Satan has you and he's going to sift you as wheat. He had made the peril spectacularly clear. And they were so self-confident. They were so complacent. They said, it's all right, they said to him. They said to God, their son, it's all right. <laughs> but they would, they would never let him down, never. The great never of the, of the orator, never. And Peter was the most emphatic of all. And yet moments after the warning, the ones who said they would never leave him, they left him. They ran off like frightened rabbits when the soldiers and Judas arrived. The Lord comes back to the sleepers. You know, he didn't bring them there just to be observers and reporters of what happened in the garden. Like you, you say, um, Pastor, pray for me now. Will you, will you pray for me? You, you are so conscious by yourself. You, you, you need somebody to pray with you. Simon, I just asked for an hour, just 60 minutes of prayer. You said, no, oh, you'd never let me down. You couldn't watch an hour. Do you know, sometimes 
people hear of the lapses, the falls of Christian leaders. And you know what we say? We say, ah, if only someone had spoken to them. That's what we say. If only someone had warned them. Well, maybe. But someone had warned these boys. They had been the recipients of marvelous pastoral care. And most assuredly, someone had spoken to them most plainly not to fail. They failed, despite their privileges and their warnings. And then lastly this, they failed when they were most needed, because they were needed. They weren't taken into the garden for tokenism. Watch with me. I'm watching. You watch. I'm going to pray. You pray. That's it. The gregariousness, the humanness of Christ. He chose 12 to be with him. He wasn't a loner, was he? He loved companionship. He loved friendship. Oh, I've longed to have the Passover meal with you, he said. He really wanted them to pray with him. He needed them to pray with him. He needed them at least stay awake, keep your eyes open, and look. <laughs> he needed that. Off to sleep they went. Maybe when the Lord most needs us, maybe when the church most needs us, maybe when our family most needs us, then we fail. And sometime then, as you examine your Christian life, and think of the future that you'll be aware of the fiery darts of the wicked one, how cruel he is. And you'll be aware of the power of remaining sin in us. And you won't stop praying. And you won't stop looking to Christ the Christ who prayed for us, the Christ who is praying for us tonight and who calls us to this high and holy privilege. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask Thee to bless and help us as we see this wonderful Savior of ours. He humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And now you've highly exalted him. And, and we join to him, we'll be exalted one day. But oh, help us to live like he lived and pray like he prayed in this short and uncertain earthly pilgrimage. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I've asked that we can sing uh, the hymn now. Um, Hallelujah, what a Savior. <laughs>